Hello again. August 24th was supposed to be a joyous occasion for Ukrainians, a celebration of 31 years of independence from the former Soviet Union. But of course it's being overshadowed by the sixth month anniversary of Russia's military operation. This year's festivities were muted as Ukraine reels from a conflict that has killed thousands, displaced millions, with parts of the country in ruins. Many cities remained under curfew as fighting continues in the eastern part of the country and the south. We begin with this report from CTGN's Stephanie Free. This is the sound residents of multiple cities throughout Ukraine woke up to on Independence Day morning. In central Kyiv, this was the site on display. Ukraine's 31st year of independence from former Soviet rule was largely observed in solemn reflection. Independence Day this year also marks six months since Russia initiated its military campaign in Ukraine. As fighting continues, the country is on high alert for Independence Day Russian missile strikes. Ukraine's president is defiant. We finally became united, a new nation born on February 24th at 4 a.m., not born, but reborn, a nation that did not cry, scream, or panic, one that did not flee, did not give up, and did not forget. Major Russian advances in Ukraine have stalled in recent weeks. Intel analysts predict Ukraine is gearing up for a next phase offensive. According to international NGO figures, tens of thousands of Ukrainian civilians and soldiers have been killed since Russia's February 24th campaign began. In Kyiv, President Zelensky paid tribute to those who have lost their lives defending Ukraine throughout the years. I hope it will end during the current year so we can be joyful next spring and not lose more time. Many Ukrainians opted to stay home this holiday. Others ventured out intentionally to display their national pride. Stephanie Fried, CGTN, Odessa, Ukraine. Well, to discuss this and more, let's bring in our guest. Joining us from London is Marcus Papadopoulos. He is a historian, analyst and author specialising in Russia and the former Soviet Union. From Bar Brussels, we have Peter Klepp. He is the editor-in-chief of Brussels Report. And here in Washington, D.C., Anton Fedyashin. He is, of course, a professor of history at American University. And also in Kyiv is Pavlo Kukta. He's the former Ukrainian acting minister of the economy. Uh, welcome to you all for the show, Pavlo. Obviously, uh, we want to start with you, being the day it is, and also where you are. Uh, Stephanie alluded to a lot of how Ukrainians seem to be feeling at the moment. Does that resonate with you? And where do you feel, personally, everything is going uh, six months from, uh, uh, from this uh, uh, incursion by Russia? Mm, thank you for having me, Nathan. Mm, well, no today, actually, I drove from Lviv to Kyiv, so I kind of traveled throughout the whole western part of the country. Uh -huh. uh, and this was a day of air raid sirens in Ukraine. Yeah. So for most of the time, the gas stations, for example, were closed because there was constant, uh, constant air raids, more than 10 uh, today in almost all regions. Uh, there were Rus Russian cruise missile strikes throughout the country, uh, mostly on civilian um, targets, uh, some of them quite weird, like a rural road in the uh, Poltava region, uh, but others quite deadly, like a train station in Dnipro region, where I believe a couple of dozen people have been killed. Uh, otherwise, uh, generally, the cities were a bit empty. So when I came to Kiev, it's emptier today than usual, because many people uh, seeing the news and expecting some kind <coughs> of uh, 
actions from Russia that would be aimed at terrorizing the population, many people have left uh, to be out outside of the cities, particularly the capital. Uh, I know in some people who were buying um, iodine solutions, right, um, the drugs that you can take in case there is a radiation leak because of the situation in the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. So in general, there was an expectation that on this date, which is quite symbolic, Russia would try to do something, and this something would be aimed at terrorizing the civilian population, which well, is essentially what happened yes, with the missile strike. Explain to us about that, because uh, details seem pretty cloudy, but, but what's your impression? In general, they seem to have lobbed missiles around the country, generally at non-military targets. So again, a train station hit at Dnipro, nothing military there. A rural road in Poltava, just plain weird. They wasted a multi-million dollar cruise missile on an empty place. But in general, this seems to have been, it's much more active. Usually there's not that many air raid sirens throughout the day in Ukraine. This is very untypical. So they were trying to show that they are not leaving Ukraine alone, that they will keep pressure in the country. That's at least my reading of what the Russians are doing. Um, you said a, a day of silence, but also a, a day of defiance. And I'd like to get Marcus uh, Papadopoulos' reaction to this uh, off the bat, because we did hear a very defiant uh, speech from uh, Vladimir Zelensky, who basically said, look, six months into this, uh, we are not going to stop until everything is returned to Ukraine. Let's take a listen. To us, Ukraine means the whole of Ukraine, all 25 regions, without any concessions or compromise. We don't know these words. They were destroyed by missiles on February 24th. Donbass is Ukraine, and we'll get it back, no matter how hard this path will be. Crimea is Ukraine, and we'll get it back, no matter how hard this path will be. Marcus, uh, what do you take of the defiant speech by Vladimir Zelensky? And is he, is he right? You see Ukraine doing that? Or do you see Russia uh, making these incremental advances that it has been making uh, continue to stick? Allow me to say, first of all, that in March of 1991, a referendum was held in the Soviet Union in which the Soviet people were asked, do they wish to preserve the Soviet Union? Okay. In the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, over 70% of the population voted to preserve the Soviet Union. The USSR was only dissolved by the actions of Boris Yeltsin, Leonid Kravchuk, and Stanislav Shushkevich, yes. which was completely against the will of the Soviet people. Now, turning well, I, to okay, the war... Look, I think we know the history, and I, I do get your point here, because what you're essentially doing is drawing a question mark over the legitimacy of the state of Ukraine, correct? And, and why are you choosing to do that now? Now, let me turn to the war in Ukraine. What Zelensky said today has very, bears very little relation to the actual situation on the ground. The reality is that Russia has been winning the war from day one, from the 24th of February. The Russian high command is one of the most revered and feared of all high commands in the world. Indeed, the Russian High Command's meticulous planning, which includes extensive contingency plans, is quite astounding. Accordingly, in the south of Ukraine, the Russian military campaign is going according to plan. And indeed, in recent days, the Russian army has made advances in the Nikolaev and Kherson oblasts, which is another demonstration that there will be no uh, counteroffensive in the south by the Ukrainian army. Okay. Turning to the Donbass, the Russian campaign there is again, so far, going according to plan. Turning to the north of Ukraine, specifically in Kiev and Sumy, the situation needs to be explained. The Russian army was not defeated at the gates of Kiev. There was no battle for Kiev. The Russian army probed 
to see if the Ukrainian government would capitulate. When it became very obvious to the Russians that that would not happen, then the Russians implemented a contingency okay. plan, which saw Russian forces Marcus. relocate to the Donbass. Okay, Marcus, Any I, military I, Marcus. expert in the world will tell you that the ability of an army to, um, to Marcus. Uh, adapt to a situation as quickly and effectively as the Russian army did makes the Russian army extremely... Yeah, Marcus, little. OK, I, I get where you're going. I think everyone gets where they're going. Uh, Pavel, do you just want to pick up on that? Because obviously he said a lot. Mm, I would just be short. I mean, uh, I will not go into some military discussion sure. on the quality of the Russian armed forces, though I'm not of a very high opinion of that, having fought them, actually, on the battlefield. But uh, otherwise... Uh, look, uh, they were trying to march into Ukraine, flags raised, they expected no resistance. They suffered extremely heavy casualties on the Kyiv. After that, they retreated from the capital, suffering these heavy casualties. And since then, the front line is mostly stable. The advances that have happened have happened in the east are extremely okay. small, if you look at the map. And in the south, where my, uh, where people who I fought with together are still there, there have been zero gains by Russia in the recent days. Zero. No. Okay. Nothing happened. Well, OK. And I'll obviously let Marcus have a right reply um, uh, to, to what you say later on as well. Uh, let's bring in our other guests. Uh, Anton Fedyashin, we have had these competing narratives, haven't we? Uh, and you've been very good at analysing uh, where the holes are. Where are the holes in these arguments? <laughs> Well, listen, uh, it's, it's, it's not about holes. It's about what the, what the map uh, looks like. First right. of all, I, I have to disagree with Pablo. The Russians have made gains in the south, and I get my information from the Ukrainian general staff uh, announcements, announcements, who were actually the first to uh, declare just over the weekend that the Russians had taken uh, a village called Volgadatne and they're moving towards uh, Mykolaiv. This is coming out of, uh, out of Kiev, not from uh, Moscow. So the Russians are making very small, but they're making gains in the south. The only f southern offensive, Kherson offensive, that we're seeing right now is, unfortunately for the Ukrainians, a Russian offensive, and they're slowly making gains in the uh, in the east. Uh, look, the 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 problem here for the Ukrainians, unfortunately, is that the Russians have no calendar. They set no artificial dates. This is an open-ended. Uh, conflict for them. And this is very much a war of attrition. And in terms of economic and military attrition, uh, the Russians can withstand much, much more of it than the Ukrainians um, uh, can. Uh, Zelensky's rhetoric is becoming increasingly uh, defined. I understand him uh, fully. Um, but there are reasons for why he's doing it. Number one, uh, the weapon supplies from the West are dwindling. Europe is no longer pouring weapons into Ukraine. And even the recent uh, massive contribution, by the way, by the Biden... Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Today's near $4 it billion. Has every right to, listen, it has every right to do so. The Americans have done this before. But look, this is the 18th tranche of money and weapons so far... That has maybe slowed down the Russians. It certainly hasn't turned things around. But I actually read um, Dr. Call, the, uh, the Pentagon representative's um, statement today. It's very interesting when you look at the actual documents. These weapons now are not coming out of U.S. supplies. In other words, they can't be readily delivered. This is money coming out of a special fund. And according to the Pentagon itself, these weapons will be getting to Ukraine within a year, two, or three yes, years. Yes, because they're now going to the factories, not to of the stockpile. They're yeah. actually yes. ordering from the military-industrial uh, complex, right? Hmm. Three years from now, uh, this, isn't gonna, uh, this is not going to help Ukraine. Number two, because of how uh, poorly things are going militarily for Ukraine, Zelensky is beginning to face domestic opposition. We don't talk about that much in the West because for obvious reasons there are other things that are, um, you know, in front of people's eyes. But <clears throat> Zelensky has two very powerful challengers within Ukraine, the mayor of Kiev, uh, Klitschko, and then um, his predecessor, Petro Poroshenko, yeah. both of whom have their own parties, both of which are fairly powerful political forces. And Zelensky, unfortunately for him and his career, has not been able to okay. fully uh, deliver. So, look, I, I think we should take his rhetoric also with a grain of salt and look at 
at the broader context here. Well, let's uh, talk about broader context. Let's hop over to Brussels. Uh, Peter Klepp, thanks for being uh, so patient while uh, uh, we, we talk to all our other guests. Um, you know, Emmanuel Macron came out today and talked about um, the, being with Ukraine uh, in the long term. There seems to be a feeling in Europe that this is definitely going to go into the long term with their eye on the winter, of course, Russian uh, gas supplies. Six months into this conflict, uh, is the is the is the message of unity you hear from Paris and, and perhaps slightly less so from Berlin real, or are they fissures within the Union too as we go past this six-month anniversary? Well, I think um, there's two parts of this uh, story. On the one hand, there's definitely unity. I mean, the West in general, but also European uh, nations uh, have been acting um, more or less uh, in unison. Um, when it comes to to this uh, massive uh, challenge, really, you, you don't also... see you don't see some uh, more reluctant. Uh, you know, well, for example, the yeah, way I've read so... it is that the Eastern European mm -hmm. countries, generally on the border with Russia or Ukraine, seem to be a lot more eager, and the ones further away, with the exception perhaps <laughs> of London, yeah. uh, a little bit more circumspect. That, that's what, of course, what I was going to add. I'm so sorry. That there's um, there's two parts of it of this, um, but I would say that uh, when push comes to show, uh, things are, are being decided um, more or less unanimously. Um, it's true that, of course, the hawks in this conflict are uh, the British and the Baltics and, and Poland, mm. um, and, uh, and the doves are clearly um, France and Germany that, um, that are, let's say, uh, more in favor of uh, trying to explore the diplomatic um, uh, options, uh, you know, to the to the maximum. Um, that said, uh, ultimately, when things have to be decided, things are being decided for the better or for worse. Uh, there's been weapon deliveries, even financed by the European um, Union. There's been um, very far-going sanctions being imposed on Russia, and actually, the sanctions is uh, where you would expect uh, most of the divisions, where we have seen most of the divisions. The reason why they are limited to coal and uh, and partially to oil right. uh, is because of these uh, divisions. Uh, but um, actually, Russia has been quicker by um, uh, by, by basically interrupting the gas flows to Europe. So so um, um, we didn't have to come to see it that far to have uh, European divisions on whether to impose a gas embargo okay. on Russia, because that's what Putin basically uh, decided. And a quick follow-up, you know, six months, uh, you said the un unity seems to be holding. But what about in six months' time? And what about the hopes of some sort of diplomatic push from Paris or elsewhere, considering we've seen a diplomatic push when it comes to grain and also, of course, the Zafiris uh, nuclear plant from, from, uh, from uh, Ankara, from New York, uh, the United Nations, and other countries wouldn't mind getting involved as well? Well, indeed, uh, very, very good point. Uh, it's, it's very hopeful to see that on grain, a diplomatic um, solution of some sort, uh, or progress at least, uh, was, uh, was achieved. Um, and uh, the analysis in European capitals is that the strategy of Putin is to, to sort of uh, reduce the gas flows to Europe, which uh, Putin then hopes would uh, move public opinion in, in EU member states to, to push governments uh, to sort of uh, urge Ukraine to go to the table and sort something out with Putin. I mean, that's the analysis right. uh, in Europe. To what extent that's, that's actually the case, uh, I, don't think, um, I don't think that's so clear. Um, I mean, will European citizens, uh, uh, and have they already been complaining about uh, all of this? Yes, yes very uh, much true. So, yeah. On the other hand, um, European countries are moving off Russian gas much more quickly than, uh, than many people expected. So, so it's not so obvious as uh, some uh, have claimed. With very high bills, though, and that's going to be very interesting uh, to see. Uh, you're getting a lot of complaints, aren't you? Yeah. Um, I'd like to go back to you, Pavlo. Uh, in Kiev. But before I talk to you, uh, there was a UN Security Council meeting today. Uh, the Russia called. Uh, and uh, they very much sort of pushing back on this whole idea that they are holding the nuclear plant hostage. Let's listen to the uh, US, uh, sorry, <laughs> Moscow's ambassador to the UN on this. 
At the last meeting, not a single Western delegation had the courage to condemn the shelling of the station by the Ukrainian armed forces and ask the regime to stop it. Nor was the courage found in European capitals. The capitals are simply launching appeals to Russia to stop the so-called recent activities surrounding the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. We're under the impression that our colleagues exist in their own parallel reality in which the Russian military are themselves shelling the station that they are protecting and are using the American systems for that. Well, that's uh, uh, definitely Russian dry wit there for you. Um, I'm sure you're used to it, uh, Pablo. But he does have a point that, that, OK, they may be in possession of the plant, but a lot of shelling is coming from Ukraine uh, forces. Uh, what? Uh, what can we see the way through here? Because obviously this would be a disaster uh, if there was some sort of radiation leak or worse. Look, the solution is on the table and has been there for a number of weeks, right? It's demilitarization of the nuclear power plant and Ukraine is ready for that. And agreements have been reached to, to that end with the UN, with the head of the United okay. Nations in Lviv last week. Again, it's totally up to the Russians. So, okay, they are putting up artillery, they are firing at Ukrainian positions and then complaining that somehow the station that they fully control and occupy is not demilitarized. Plain and simple. Right, they're using it as a yeah. shield, you're saying, essentially. Exactly. You know, if they want to get rid of the risk of the catastrophe, it's very easy to demilitarize. It's not a strategic town. It's actually situated behind a large lake. It's not even somewhere where, let's say, a Ukrainian assault would come or something of that sort. It's pure terror, nothing more. No, it's very interesting. Marcus, I, I want to come back to you um, and change tack a little bit, because six months part of the war uh, um, uh, over Ukraine, of course, has been the international sanctions. And uh, we have seen um, a huge change in sort of perceptions of those over the last six months. First of all, we saw the ruble tumbling, interest rates going up. Every business, uh, Western business uh, listed on the Fortune 500 seemed to be departing. Of course, everyone did a story about McDonald's opening in the Soviet Union and then pulling out uh, under Putin after uh, Russian forces went into Ukraine. Uh, but then there seems to be this turnaround where Russia seems to be getting record receipts for, for energy because, of course, of the prices, but also weathering the storm domestically. How are they doing this? Russia is the most sanctioned country in the history of economic warfare. Yet despite that, Russia is not just withstanding the West's economic crusade against its economy. The Russia is actually prevailing. Indeed, in recent days, Reuters reported that since February of this year, when the Russian military campaign commenced, the Russian economy has secured over $300 billion worth of new contracts to uh, export both uh, gas and oil, which is quite astonishing. And, and largely now, from Asia, right? I mean, we're talking about India, China, but also uh, other Asian countries that haven't chosen, and African countries that haven't chosen to join uh, the US and EU pressure for sanctions. Indeed. And as you correctly said, um, uh, sub-Saharan Africa and also North Africa. And Latin America. The reality, the reality of the West's economic war against Russia is that it has backfired. It has backfired so terribly that on the horizon for Europe, including Britain, looms a catastrophe in which millions upon millions upon millions of Europeans, including Britons, face the distinct possibility of uh, falling into poverty, of becoming homeless. Now, Russia is not using energy, gas and oil as a weapon against the European people. No, Russia has responded to stringent, severe sanctions placed on it what would any impartial party expect Russia to do? It's action reaction. The reality is that Russia is actually winning this economic battle and the West has actually shot itself in the foot. Okay. So much so that European governments this winter, at the end of this year and into 2023, face the real possibility of collapsing. Okay, uh, Anton, do you agree with what Marcus said? 
Yes, I do, because on this economic front, um, uh, things really look uh, pretty bleak for Europe. Now, listen, I want to balance out what Mark uh, correctly pointed out by also, of course, mentioning the Russian side. Depending on which industries you look, the Russian economy has, of course, been impacted by uh, these sanctions. And Mark's absolutely right. They are unprecedented. Yeah. So if you look, for example, at the automobile industry, it has been hit very uh, hard. But everyone is still receiving uh, wages. Uh, there, there's been a collapse of production, but not a collapse of the industry. And I can guarantee yeah. you that the Russians are already looking at alternative markets for imports. And once they find them, which they definitely will, um, European companies, Western companies in general, are going to find it very difficult to come back into the Russian market on uh, the, the earlier terms. They'll be coming back on, uh, uh, on Russian terms. The Ukrainians here are running, unfortunately, a really uh, great uh, risk. The grim realist in me um, uh, tells me that um, the tragic conflict in Ukraine may become a sideshow uh, because if um, the energy prices uh, persist into the winter, which they are yeah. almost guaranteed to do, Europe is going to descend into such an economic tailspin that most people will simply not have okay. the time or the resources to, to follow what's going on in Ukraine, let alone devote okay. resources to it. Sorry to cut you off, Anton, but I want to get Peter, uh, Peter in again before we close. Uh, Anton has a point here that, uh, you know, uh, we could see old people freezing uh, in uh, the winter. We have inflation running at something like 13% projected in the UK, uh, higher elsewhere. Has Europe paid a bigger economic price for this war than the Russians? And of course, there is the develop, you know, the, 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 the more developing world in the, in the global south already getting punished by inflation, high oil prices and grain. So essentially, are the decisions coming out of Brussels backfiring both on the Europeans and the people they like to show that they lead the world? Well, if you look at the history of, uh, of sanctions, uh, they have never been very successful to achieve the, um, the supposed uh, goal. Yes, and and this time around, uh, even if it's a bit more uh, different perhaps than in other cases, I mean, the success is not that obvious. Uh, if you compare it, for example, with the weapon deliveries to Ukraine, I mean, that's been a resounding success uh, to help Ukraine at least. Uh, to what extent the sanctions have helped Ukraine or have undermined Putin, I think it's, it's tough to make a case for that, uh, especially because then Putin has hit back and has actually, I think, also self-inflicted harm uh, by uh, destroying Russia's reputation as a reliable uh, gas supplier that even dated back from Soviet times. So nobody's really winning from this. Um, it's very difficult and tricky, I think, to make predictions. Nobody knows if okay. Europe is going to fold completely or, or if, uh, if, if much is going to change. I think okay. a lot of it depends, actually, on the, on the battlefield. Peter, Peter, I'm sorry. The clock has told us we have to go. I want to thank you in Brussels. I want to thank Marcus in London. Of course, Anton uh, here in Washington, D.C. And thanks again to Pavlo as well in Kiev. Always great to have you all on. That's it for this discussion. I'm Nathan King in Washington, D.C. See you soon on another edition of The Heat.